Okay, Ali, sorry, I started recording a little bit late. We are doing an activity where students are talking to each other in rows. Um, we're reading the Simone de Beauvoir passage, just the first two pages. And then I asked a couple questions about it. One, I asked, what does she see as the problem with defining gender biologically? Two, keep talking. <laughs> write down, how about in the margins, write down what Stella, how Stella would think of us. Sorry, I'm just catching Ali up because I forgot to record. Um, two, you're going to talk about what the problem is with defining gender just in terms of how gender feels. So femininity in this case, what's the problem with defining women by their femininity? Um, and then three, we talked about how would Stella define being a woman? So um, since you're not here with a partner, just write down your answers to those questions. Okay, same partner. I want you to discuss now how Blanche would define being a woman. Same, different, what would the differences be? Okay, right in the margins. What, what does Blanche think about being a woman? How would she, what would she say is the de definition of a woman? All right, move again. Okay, if this is true, if there's problems with uh, defining gender biologically, defining gender um, based on femininity, masculinity, then what would Simone de Beauvoir say about just getting rid of gender as a concept altogether? She does talk about the problems with just ignoring gender then. Okay, discuss. This is in the third paragraph, by the way, where she talks about this. Okay, now before you move, I want you to look right at the top of the uh, back half of the page, the second page, top of the page, she says, um, well, it starts at the bottom, but it says the attitude of defiance of many American women proves that they are haunted by a sense of their femininity. Oh, I'm, I have such a hard time saying femininity, a hard time feeling it too. All right, so discuss that word haunted. Why do you think people, what does that mean for a woman to be haunted by her femininity? Like 
Okay, write in the margins what you discussed. And then move. <laughs> Okay, ultimately, um, she does give us the definition of what a woman is. It might not be totally satisfactory because of the definition that she gives us, but her book, it's called The Second Sex. <clears throat> it's actually just called Second Sex. I don't think it has a the in it, but whatever. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So she does say, this is what woman is. She is the second sex. So what does that mean according to De Beauvoir? Discuss with your new partner. It is in this big long paragraph on the back. There's a part here where it says right in the this giant paragraph on the back in the middle it says man represents both the positive and the neutral that's the part i want you to focus on what does that mean mm -hmm. man represents both the positive and the neutral Okay, let's pause and make sure we get this idea. So what is what does that mean when she says that man is the positive or man is the neutral? Yeah, Abby. Okay, so she might be talking a little bit about the patriarchy, right? This idea that like, uh, you know, in government, in business, in all these institutions, men are at the top and that they kind of dictate what women are doing. I think that's part of what she's saying here. I think it goes a little bit deeper than that. You have an idea? What does it mean that men are neutral? Because I get that when you say positive, but yeah. I think neutral was kind of like what you were talking about with the similarities between the two genders. And by giving it to the men, I think she was saying that men aren't open to finding those similarities because they deny that there are any. Mm, interesting. Interesting. So this goes back to what she was saying about how you look around and um, so in some ways she kind of like hints at what's to come because these days we talk a lot about is gender actually a binary is it a spectrum and so on and she kind of says like maybe it is maybe these gen maybe these differences are superficial she says earlier but right now these differences exist and in 1949 Paris there were you know there were things like the cabaret and there were things like drag shows and so on but it was still like you look out on the streets and everyone 
everyone you can identify, male, female, in these two categories, right? And she might be looking at that and saying, what is the, like, what, who kind of promotes the distinct differences between the two? And so for when, what you're saying here about men not seeing the similarities, it's like this last bit where she says women is other, but that sounds like it's only according to men. I think it, again, it goes a little bit deeper than that. So, you know, when we talk about like all mankind and we use that word mankind, that's kind of the idea she's saying that man is even at the center of woman and woman is just this extra little two letters that we tack on to man. She's talking about how man is the neutral form. She's talking about this idea of like a platonic ideal of person. That's why I tried that experiment with you guys just drawing people. I've done it with doctors before, but not with people. It was interesting that we were divided. Um, so maybe things have progressed since then. Maybe her ideas don't hold up. I'm not totally sure. But she is saying that when you think of a person, the personhood of like a human being, is a man, a male form. And woman is the extra thing. Woman is the deviation from that male form. So like this, the idea goes back biblically that Adam is the ideal form of person and woman is formed like from his rib. And so she's kind of the extra bit, right? And there are, there is kind of like, there's a book called Invisible Women that just became popular a couple years ago about data that kind of proves this idea. It is true that in some ways we are living in a man's world, you know, we're all living in a man's world. So like cupboard height, where you like can reach in and grab stuff, that's built for the average height of men <laughs> and women have to reach up, you know, sometimes. Um, or like uh, safety in cars, like airbag safety that's built with ma a male body in mind. They only very recently started using female, like uh, anatomically correct female dummies to decide if it's actually safe for us to be in a car. You know, there's little things like that. There's linguistic things too, that like for a long time, and these days it's not um, so prominent, but for a long time it was actors and actresses, right? Um, as a way of like, you kind of tack on a, a bit of language to the end and almost like romance language, Germanic languages, a lot of them will distinguish always between professor and professora, right? You add on the little a. And if we were an entire room of women, it was if it was 60, 60 women, and I said, hey gals, we'd be okay with that. Well, maybe not because that's an annoying way to address people, but like, hey gals, <laughs> we'd be okay with that. But if there is 60 women and one Isaac and we say hey gals, it's like, what? Everybody look at Isaac and say, that's not how you address us. But if it was 60 women and one man and I said, hey guys, everybody would be okay with it, right? Um, that's just kind of like a neutral term. So there's linguistic ways, there's physical ways, there's ways that like we are, we have kind of built the world around what it means to be a man. And that's kind of what she's talking about here is that man is the human type and women is kind of like an, an alternative version of the human type. And that this creates this idea that women are other. So like women could be more mysterious. Like what is a woman thinking? We never know what a woman is thinking, right? <laughs> um, so it's like, it's this way that she becomes a little bit more mysterious, more othered because of this. Does that make sense? All right, cool. So with that idea, and you don't have to buy that idea if you don't want to, but, but with that idea, what would Stanley, how would Stanley define being a man? Yeah. Okay, discuss with your partner. <laughs> if you ask Stanley, what is a man? What would he say? Okay, right in the margins. How would Stanley define what being a man is?
I'd love some research though. Sorry to, this is a tangent, but I'd love some research on spaces that are more often female spaces if those have been built with women in mind. Like for example, like, like teaching, yeah, like the classroom. Are there, has this classroom been built with more female versions or is it just like, this is just what a building is and all buildings kind of have the same. Yeah, then it'd be even, everything would be way shorter. <laughs> right? <laughs> all right, move. <laughs> All right, there's a sentence here that says it's on it's in the second to last paragraph the human the thus humanity is male and man defines woman not in herself but as relative to him. I want you to apply that to streetcar named desire. So we've been thinking about how the characters define their own gender, but let's think about how Stanley defines women. What does Stanley think woman is? Okay, discuss. Right in the margins. How would Stanley define women? So we're going to move one more time. Finish right in. Okay, we're back at the beginning, right? Oh, perfect. Symmetry. <laughs> All right, move. Okay, in this second to last paragraph, De Beauvoir is also talking about a kind of internalized. Um, I don't know that we want to call it sexism, but an internalized otherness that women feel. So she, she's quoting someone and she says she cannot think of herself without man. And then a little bit later, it says she is the incidental, the inessential, as opposed to the essential. He is the subject. He is the absolute. She is the other. I want you to discuss if you think the female characters in this novel have internalized this concept of being the other. Can the female characters think of themselves without men? in other words. And that's Stella and Blanche. Okay, discuss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. 
<laughs> Next time we do a role play, it should be one of you is Simone de Beaufort. <laughs> what would she say? Okay, write down in the margins the answer to that question, what you discussed. <laughs> you can head back to your seat. All right, so um, I think that that little excerpt from the second sex kind of gives us an idea of um, how the different characters might be thinking about gender in different ways. They have different ways of understanding their own gender. Like I kind of suspect that Blanche feels that gender is more performative, something she has some control over, a way to kind of like get what she wants by performing the other, you know? Because sometimes Blanche seems so innocent and sweet and Southern bellish, you know? And then other times she's like, screaming and yelling about the tarantula and having relationships with many strangers you know like she kind of switches on a dime depending on what the situation calls for um whereas stella seems to think like her gender is potentially more essential to her um that she sees it as like the source of her desire and her relationships and kind of like the joy of having a baby and staying with the baby and staying with the family unit and, and so on, right? So there's different ways that they're understanding gender. And I think that relates to these different ways that they are just understanding the world. So we're gonna apply a different philosophy now too. So we've got our, our feminist text and now we're going to be thinking of what is called epistemology. So you need paper for, you can just do it on your picture paper. We're taking notes. All right, so there's something called epistemological well-being. Epistemology is a school of thought where we decide how we know things. It's a philosophical concept. Um, it seems obvious, like, oh, I know that Huck is a real person because he is standing in front of me and I have heard him talk, right? So I assume he's a real person. But can I really know that? Like, couldn't I be in a dog's dream, <laughs> right? It's that kind of an idea. Yeah, so that's epistemology. It's this idea of how we take information from our world and figure out what we know. Um, so it's ways of knowing. And I think different characters in this book have different ways of knowing the world. And I think they have different attachments to what we would define maybe if we have more solid, I don't know, presence in this world, what we would define as the real world. I think the different characters have different attachments to what that real world is, you know? Um, and if you don't have a solid attachment to what the real world is, that's when insanity starts to crop up. And we see that in Darrell, we saw that in Lear. We saw, why are all of our books about being crazy this year? Uh, Pride and Prejudice, there we go. Pride and Prejudice was solid, people just accepting that the real world is what the real world is, yeah. Um, you could argue that Mrs. Bennett is a little bit detached from the real world. <laughs> That's um, true. She just pushing all of Harry's marriage, marriage. Yeah, that's true. She's not institutionalized yeah. like the like crime and punishment. Like the rest of our books, like someone has become institutionalized. Oh boy. All right. Well, I guess that just says a lot about your teacher. Yeah. 
<laughs> anyway, so if you don't have a firm grasp on that, that is when we start to lose our epistemological well-being. Um, you could argue that actually living right now in our internet-soaked age, uh, we have lost a little bit of epistemological well-being. Like sometimes we read stuff and we don't know what's true or what's false anymore, right? Or have you seen a deep fake recently? They are getting way too good. I watched this next Scream uh, in the franchise. What's that? Scream 8? I don't know. You guys watch the Scream movies? And this new Scream just came on streaming and I watched it and they used a deep fake of a character from the first movie and I literally could not tell. I was like, no, Ski Ulrich has aged in the last 20 years. I was looking at him and I could not tell, which is so terrifying. So we're, we're on the verge of being thrown into epistemological hellscape honestly um <laughs> with fake news and with russian bots and and whatever so we got to get a firm grasp on this and there are three things that we're looking for in getting a firm grasp on the ways that we know things we've got beliefs this is where we have faith that things are true right um we have and trust that things are true i believe what and pixie dust <laughs> i believe certain things about my world um and those might not have like specific factual evidence with it but i believe it nevertheless those kind of an idea those kind of ideas right there's also facts which is just truth facts and what we would call the known and this is what, I mean, epistemology says, how do we arrive at truth? How do we arrive at belief? It's like, can we actually say what is true and what is not? Um, but for some things, we just say, this is known. Um, I, I believe it, but also I have factual evidence to prove it. And the third part that we have to think about with epistemology is the justification. This is the part that says um, true belief. Let's see reasoning to show that your beliefs are true so let's say i believe that there is a death rate here i believe in it and i can say all right well i can touch it i can kick it i can see it all of these sensory experiences to me that is the justification that that belief is true those two things don't always line up. Sometimes I believe things without the facts and they're it's missing the justification. Like for example, tomorrow, I think it says it's gonna to be totally sunny outside. If I say, but I believe it's going to rain, just because then it rains tomorrow does not mean that my belief was justified. The weather does crazy things. That doesn't mean that like my fantasy is actually a solid, true epistemology. Yeah. I was saying in this way of thinking that your senses to be true like because i'm touching this then it is therefore there that is one is kind of just the way that i'm like interpreting this that's that's where the question comes right it's the different ways of justifying are the different kinds of epistemologies the different ways of knowing that we figured out as humans that we can trust so different ways of knowing different sort of schools of thought will say yes you can trust that this is here because of your senses other schools of thought will say all of your senses are filled through your mind so you can really only trust your own mind and it just depends on what kind of justification these different philosophies are giving does that kind of make sense like but i don't want yeah. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. Yeah, Whitney. If you're stretching it, like mind just stretching it more like an experiment, or would it still be in this mindset? Like if you said, yeah. I believe it's going to rain tomorrow, but it says it's going to be sunny, but you justify it with it's Utah, we live in Utah, and then you pull all the factual evidence that Utah's weather does not. And fall. you look at March and you say every day on March 16th in the past it has rained, then yeah, I think that does become a kind of justification. You could kind of move that into truth. Oh. Yeah, I think so. All right, so what epistemology is dealing with though is this part the justification, how beliefs become true, and how people justify that their beliefs are true. And there are different ways of doing that. The first one we're going to talk about is empiricism. This is like, this is the one that you just believe in if you're not um, a philosopher, <laughs> if you don't want to like 
you know, hurt your brain. <laughs> and if you don't want to like upset what the real world is in your head, you don't want to have a dissociative episode. You're just going to be an empiricist, right? This is the one that scientists believe. This is where you can trust your senses. So knowledge is gained. through perception of the senses and you get this through experience with the real world there is a real world according to epistemologists that is not always the case according to all these theories but epistemologists say there is a real world and we as human beings and even animals and everybody else can come to an agreement about what the real world is so scientists will say okay we got to we got to you know prove that germs are a thing all right then we need to look at them we need to like count them i don't know anything about science <laughs> we need to do all of these experiments through our experience of the real world and then we can gain knowledge of what germs are so again this is the kind of philosophy where i can say i see this desk i feel this desk i can trust that everybody else can see and feel this desk as well there is a real world and i am interacting with it and that's how i know things make sense all right they uh were kind of countered by the idealists and idealism said, yeah, that wouldn't that be nice, but we actually can't know that there's a real world. <laughs> it's just impossible for us to actually know that because we can't see other people's experiences and we can't get out of our own minds. We talk about this in this class all the time. I think this is such an interesting idea, which means that knowledge is mentally constructed. That means that yeah I can feel this desk and I can kick this desk and I could even I could taste this desk I guess if I wanted to. Um, I could smell it and so on, but that does not mean that you can and I can't trust necessarily that you can I can't even trust that you guys are really here if I close my eyes and it's silent in here you guys might all disappear there is literally no way <laughs> I would say am I since I'm in a sensory deprivation chamber because I can hear you and I can smell you and all of those things I can't actually smell you um I go into a sensory deprivation I cannot trust that you guys are actually real people you might all just be figments of my imagination um there was a there was a great Buffy the Vampire Slayer episode that did that. It was like in a very late season, like season five. And suddenly Buffy wakes up and realizes like she's, it was it demon, Ven demon venom or not, but she realizes that like all of her experiences, all of her friends, all of her vampire slaying has all been like a dream. And they do, it's usually those episodes are terrible, but they do a really good job where like the rest of that show, you watch it and you're like, this could all be fake. This could all be in her head. But the idealists say, don't get too hung up on that. Like it's all your perception. That doesn't mean that it's not real. Like if you're living in the matrix and it's all a perception, like it's still real to you and that's what counts. Yeah. I had a book similar, but like it was like a long series and in the last book of the series, they had this moment and it like the entire book, three quarters of the book was just awful. Like they start killing off all the main characters, like this emotional roller coaster. And then it snapped her out into all the virtual, like a virtual reality thing. Uh -huh. So they didn't tell you as a reader. And then you were like, so they're still alive? <laughs> oh, that's nice. And then my was just like, are they really? Or are they dead? Or is she just over there alive? <laughs> right, right. right. Or, or, you know, was this whole thing like, where are do they even exist? Are they even real people? Yeah, Elsa. Mm -hmm. Are you going to think of like a Batman thing where they, you know, they were killing it? And they put two different characters in the center, and the entire world of people is different, and they can't tell what's actually happening from like the main world. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, so it's kind of that same. Does that does that Batman game have to do a scarecrow? Is that why? Yeah. So there's like there's this way that you like cannot know if you are experiencing the real world or not. So it really doesn't make a lot of sense to talk about the real world. Just talk about your own experiences with things. That's yeah. fine. It's Batman. Yeah. Is the, the guy like throws powder at you and you uh, get into a nightmare state and you can't tell what's real or what's not? He gave 
he wears like a yeah, and he wears like a it's either drugs or it's magic. Sometimes it's magic. <laughs> Just depends on what era of comics you're in. <laughs> All right, next next one. <laughs> This one's called constructivism. And this is a little bit like idealism. It is like, yeah, we do see things through human perceptions, but it says that these perceptions are are socially made. We see the real world, our experience of the real world, let's say that, um, what we know of as the real world, let's put real world in quotation marks, is determined by social contracts, constructs. We talk about this so much i think we're in an era you know if you are on TikTok or you read a lot in, of you know online journals and so on we're in an era of constructivism where it feels like that's how we epistemologically are understanding the world right now it's like this idea that human beings they do only have their perception to rely on but we aren't just alone in this world Con constructivists take it for granted i guess according to the idealist but that there are other people that you guys actually do exist and you're not just a figment of my imagination and we have constructed knowledge based on our relationships with each other so it's sort of like the idea that well it's simone de beauvoir's idea is constructivist it's this idea that we know what women are because as a society, we have decided that men are kind of like the ideal shape and that women are an other and that that creates our knowledge of what woman is. That's a constructivist idea. Yeah. Have you ever met someone that's like religious, but also is like thinks of idealism or constructivism? What do you mean? Like, uh, so with religion, uh, they believe that a god or gods are real. Yeah. And if they also believe in like idealism, then how does that work? I think I think a god could make a person with an individual perspective to be relied upon. Uh, um, oh, really? Yeah, and I think that he is like trying to have the consensus to to get reestablishes that. Oh, interesting. So, like, he would be thinking about philosophy and all the geology. Oh, interesting. Well, there are philosophers who are religious that can kind of are in that same camp that tried really hard to put them together, you know, like um, there is Kierkegaard who says, yeah, we had all this ob obsession with justification of our beliefs to arrive at the truth, but why can't we just see beliefs as a good form of epistemology? Like, why do we have to ever arrive at the truth? Why can't we live in this like world of faith? Um, so there are philosophers who like were very religious. Kant was very religious actually, and he was an idealist, um, but they just said, just because we're stuck in our own perspective doesn't mean that they're you know, is no room for belief. Yeah. I think religion itself is a type of idealism. Uh, a lot of the time, like you can't prove that any religion is true or fake. There's literally no way. like with empiricist methods. Yeah. Yeah. Empiricist mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but you believe it to be true, and that's your personal truth. And so, even if other people are like, "No, that's not the real world," like you still kind of have a choice. It's yeah. your real world, yeah. Yes, idealism is affirming of belief and it's affirming of, and I don't mean to put these together, but it's affirming of fantasies. It's why we're talking about this because of Blanche. Um, so there's this way of like, um, just because it's not other people's experience of the world does not negate this experience. You know, it doesn't mean that this experience is false or a lie. Yeah, yeah. Is constructivism? Like, does there have to be like one thing that we all agree on to like reach knowledge opposite of man and do it only? Or can it be like we don't know what like happiness is without sadness? 
that can be constructivism too. Yeah, that'd be like a linguistic constructivism. Yep. Um, the idea with the desk, for example, for the constructivists, it would be like, well, this desk has always been in classrooms. We always see this shape of a desk in a classroom. So I not only know that a desk exists here, but I know what it is for, and I know how we're all meant to use it, and I know that it has a useful purpose in our society. That would be a kind of constructivist idea because we've all agreed on what the desk is for. And then there's another one, which is pragmatism, this is the last one. Pragmatism is really closely associated with empiricism, but it says the reason that we have arrived at certain conclusions is because we deem things valuable or useful to us. So we construct knowledge based on its usefulness. The idea is that there might be tons of stuff out there that we have absolutely no knowledge of, but that is because as human beings, we have not seen that stuff as useful. We haven't observed its effects. We haven't like decided that it's going to have any implications for our lives as human beings. So it is outside the realm of even our curiosity. Like we don't even know to be curious about it because it's not useful to us. So this would say like, this is a desk because I need to sit in it to get my work done. You know, it's not about like what all of you guys have agreed upon. I can kind of like turn anything into a desk if I need to, in order to like get what I need to get done. So pragmatism is like about recognizing the effects on human beings and searching for knowledge that has usefulness or consequences in our lives. I like that. You like that one? All right. So these are our four that we're gonna focus on for our characters. I'm not saying that all the characters have a different epistemology, but I do think there are way different ways in which they think. So we've got Blanche, Stella, Stanley, and Mitch. All right, in your groups, I want you to talk about which epistemology you think each of these characters ascribes to, like how, they might know, not know, I don't expect that Stanley knows these four terms, right? But kind of when we look at the book, which one does he seem to like rely on for his epistemological well-being, like assuring himself that the world is a real world for him. Does that make sense? All right, discuss them. Which, which character is which epistemology? Yes. Like his little 
Okay, now in your notes, and still with your group, but everyone's writing it in their notes, you're going to find a passage to justify each of your answers. Oh. Of course. So try and find, I mean, you know your section really well. At this point, we, we know this play really well, actually, because of your lessons and, and so on. So go to the parts where, you know, you're familiar with it, but um, find a quote or a little passage for each. Just put down the page number is really all you need and uh, justify why you would say they are the small two that you said. Tell me what it was. It is. I didn't even think that was a thing. But then she comes out. And I was like, Do you need a charger? Yeah. 
How many characters do you have quotes for? Show me your fingers. You have all four, three, all four. Okay, cool. Hey, I want us to think about Blanche here at the end in the last 10 minutes. Um, go to page 10 of your book. when we first see Blanche interacting with her sister. 10. Um, and she gets, she, uh, she says, okay, she's sitting in a chair um, outside of the apartment, I believe. Has she been let into the apartment? I believe that she's outside the apartment. Yeah, and Eunice is going to go get Stella from the bowling alley across the street. And she, nope, she's in the apartment because she's drinking. She drinks some whiskey. Um, and she says faintly to herself, I've got to keep hold of myself. And she says that a few times in this book. She says, I've got to keep hold of myself. Um, or she tells Stella, keep hold of yourself. What could that phrase mean? I've got to keep hold of myself. We say it, all, we say it actually all the time. I have to keep hold of myself. Yeah. She, yeah. Okay, so okay, so then we are thinking of this word myself as being synonymous with reality. You've got to keep hold of myself. I've got to keep hold of reality. Is there another way that we could read that word? What does she mean by myself? Yeah, Allison. Yeah, okay, so it's like her um, complete sort of unfractured identity. And we talked about that a little bit with Stanley and Stel and Blanche, right? Like Stanley has the complete center with everything branching off of the center, like, um, you know, poker. So this is all Stanley, right? This is poker and desire and uh, food and all the things he likes, right? And it all just branches out from this complete and satisfying center. Let's erase that just to make sure no admin comes in. And for Blanche, she has these different things she wants. Like we know that Blanche wants that, right? We also know that Blanche wants to be pure though. And we know that Blanche wants to be rich, but that Blanche is actually poor. And so she's got all these different identities and they kind of overlap, they kind of don't. We've got the sense of fracturing. So holding herself together seems to be trying to hold a version of herself all together so that she can keep grasp of her own identity. Is there another way to read? Hold on, keep a hold of myself. Yeah. Kind of the justification for the method. Yeah. Okay. So it's like um, the which one is the myself part, or do you think it's both of those things? Myself would be she's using her logic to tell her that. All right. Got it. So myself is kind of like the logical brain, um, not letting animal brain, which I'm going to call emotions control her or impulses control her but the myself part is the part that is logical that is kind of the um the surface level of the human yeah Whitney and isn't that also kind of sports like control you know your animal brain like stop moving your arm that way or stop doing this I think it's also partially like um putting up a physical emotion like so I think myself I think she's not referring to herself or what, who she wants to be. Ah, okay. So, like, put up that illusion. So, it's an ideal self of who she wants to be. Yeah, okay, good. I think these can kind of go together. Like, you guys were talking about what epistemology Blanche belongs to. Which one would you say that Blanche is? I, I think so. I think I said that and maybe gave away where I was going with this. But yeah, I think Blanche is an idealist. Um, why did you guys say she was an idealist though in your little groups? What makes her seem like an idealist? Yeah. Yeah, 
Ah, uh, okay. And that's where like the really hard part about judging Blanche comes in. And the way that the book has a hard time judging Blanche too. Is Blanche a liar? Has Blanche constructed this reality on purpose with her logical brain in order to create an ideal version of herself that she wants everyone to believe in? Or does she actually believe in that ideal version of herself? And when people call her out on what are lies and kind of um, assault her with empirical evidence, she that's what causes the break. Abby? And I wonder what creates that switch. In some ways, could it be Mitch that helps create that switch for her? But you're right. She says, I know I fib a good deal of what means charm is with an illusion. Seen it? When he confronts her. Yeah. Right, Shep Huntley, yeah, yeah. Why do you think that's the moment where she can no longer keep it together anymore? Like where she confuses reality. I think she's kind of like being born into this false house and trying to create a different reality for herself and then she's like, yeah, and then that's the way she's going to it. Yeah, okay, I can see that. Yeah, Xander? I don't think she doesn't believe that she believes all of it. Okay, fascinating. So part of the fractured self, part of wanting to keep herself together then is like these different layers, like you said, logical brain or animal brain. There's these different layers and she believes all things at once. But also the things that she doesn't like, right? That she believes in. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Whitney? I think that switch really uh, came up when she just has gone too far into that illusion. Mm -hmm. Kind of like, um, oh man, I don't know what it's called, but when like actors, actually take the role of their character in the whole life. Yeah, method yeah. acting. So like I've heard of actors, you know, like if they play someone that's paralyzed, in the movie sometimes they like actually sit in the wheelchair the whole time. Yeah, Daniel Day Lewis did that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that's kind of what happened with her. I think she was trying so hard. She's like, this is my character. This is who I am. And then I think she eventually she's like, oh this is my character. And then everyone's like, whoa, you're insane. I love that comparison. Let's pick up with that comparison next time because I think that has, I've never thought of that, but um, Elia Kazan who directed this play also has a rich history of method acting. So it's, it's fascinating. Okay, and uh, what's his name? Marlon Brando was a method actor. He was method acting through this whole thing. Yeah, so the, the question here. <laughs> I know. I know. The question here is, does the book, does the book judge Blanche for lying? Does the book think that the lie, that Blanche's lying was a mistake that she made? Did it lead to her insanity or was it something else? So that's where we'll pick up next time. But yeah. Okay. Um, your papers are not due next time. I pushed them because we're not done reading this. So the papers, it should at least on Canvas uh, say this, that they are due the time after that. So that'd be Monday for you guys. Yeah. Anyway, um, the